Welcome all. Thank you so much for attending our breakfast webinar today. We hope you are all safe and doing well. It is great to see new faces on here as well. So welcome everybody. Um, feel free to turn on your videos. Don't be shy. Uh, we like <laughs> to see you as well. Uh, today we have an exciting topic to discuss as I am sure at, the, at some point you have come across COVID issues in your businesses and are looking for some direction on how to handle these unprecedented times. Someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a very long time ago. This is a famous quote from Warren Buffett. And why do I tell you guys? The reason why is because it couldn't be more or farther from the truth with the mission of the Doral Bar Association, where our mission is to make an impact in Doral Greater Miami-Dade, South Florida, in the South Florida community. By building a community of professionals that help one another, we are planting the tree that will continue to grow and provide that shade of comfort and security for our community. Our mission is to foster close community relations, promote the highest professional and ethical standards, educate and bring value to our members on business and legal issues. And we do not do this alone. We have a board ready to make plans. We have sponsors that support our initiatives and we have members that make up our community. Thank you all for being here today. With that said, today we want to make a special recognition to Leslie Snyder, who is a board member. She's providing her Zoom account um, so we can broadcast today's presentation. We also want to thank the Business Forum Group and DoorCam for their continued support and giving they give in promoting and elevating the Doral Bar Association in our community. We also want to thank, of course, Market Inc. Strategies for their amazing work that they do for our social media needs, email blasts, website edits, basically everything. <laughs> and I want to thank Banesco for their continued support of our breakfast meetings when we do go back to in-person meetings. They were committed to sponsoring us from the very beginning, and we want to recognize them for that. Today, we have Hassel Villoc, I hope I pronounced that correct, uh, VP Business Banker of the, yes. <laughs> okay, good. of the Doral branch at Banesco. He will say a few words, a, br a few words about Banesco after this video I I'm going to play.
Okay, wonderful. Oops, sorry. Oh my goodness, sorry. Hassel, you can say a few words. Thank you, Shirley. Well, this good morning. Going. Sorry, good there you morning, go. everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. My name is uh, uh, Hassel Villoch. I'm a commercial lender slash business banker with Banesco USA. Um, and I'm filling in for my colleague, uh, Alex Pinacho, who is a regular presence um, with you guys in the Doral Bar Association. He's off this week and, and well-deserved vacation before, you know, he goes back, uh, his kids go back to school next week. And I'm here to present a little bit of information about the bank. Um, I am with Banesco USA, what you saw in the video. Um, it was uh, more about um, Banesco as a group, as a, um, you know, we have a presence in different countries in Dominican Republic, um, Panama, Venezuela, Spain, and, you know, a bunch of different countries. But we are with Banesco USA, which is a five-star rated bank, uh, but it's a community bank. We have about $2 billion in assets, and we've been in that community for about 14 years now. Um, we have five branches in Brickell, Hialeah, Doral, um, Cora Gables, and Aventura. Um, we, we are a full service bank. Um, you know, we offer uh, all kinds of um, cash, man cash management services and products, um, depository products, um, lending, CRE, um, you know, small business loans, lines of credits, um, you know, you need it, you name it, uh, we'll be able to help. Um, I would like to say that, um, you know, we provide a boutique approach, We'd like to, um, you know, personalize uh, our approach to our clients. If, you know, if you need me, pretty sure I speak on behalf of most of my colleagues. If you need me over the weekend, or even after hours, please feel free to call me and I'll be sure to respond on the phone and, and address your concern. Um, just gonna leave it open now for any questions. Thank you, Jose. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat as well. We'll have some time after the presentation to answer questions about Banesco or even the presentation as well. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Okay, so now I wanted to introduce and get started on our feature presentation. Our guest speakers, we have three panelists today. I'm very excited about this. Our first speaker is April Donia. I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> uh, April is the CEO and founder of Donia Human Resources and Staffing. Um, our next speaker is Alexandra Torres from Butterfly Effect. She is the Principal Human Resources Consultant at HR Butterfly. And we also have Ivanova Nunez Avila from Banesco, and she is a human capital multinational business partner at Banesco USA. Welcome the three of you. And um, April, I will now hand you the remote control. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. No problem. Um, so as most of you know, a lot of you are on here, know me. Um, my name is April. My company is Dorney HR and Staffing. I'm sorry, uh, Shirley, do I have the rights to click? Okay. Okay, it's, uh, there we go. So a little bit about my background. I'm originally from Connecticut. I graduated from the Southern Connecticut State University with a, a BS in organizational communications. I went on a few years after to obtain my master's in um, human resources management and counseling. Uh, a few years during the end of my time as my grad, grad student, I have relocated down to Miami and I've been down here for the past nine years and I have recently started my business um, which includes um, staffing, uh, human resources con consulting. So really I wanted to take this time to talk about 
how we transition into uh, what what the workplace looks like for uh, maneuvering back in from COVID-19 and what it looks like to be an employee and an employer and how we make certain changes. Um, so I'm going to provide you with some interim guidance for businesses and employers, and this will also have some questions as well. So if any of you are transitioning your employees back, it's really important to follow the CDC guidelines, um, which this comes from, and how you make a safe environment for those that are coming on site. Sorry. Um, so obviously you probably have seen some of this, making sure employees wash hands, disinfecting frequently touched surfaces, increasing ventilation, cancel all travel with your organization, virtual meetings as we're doing now, um, mandating physical, uh, social distancing, shared food, eliminate, stagger your customer flow, online transactions, remove tables and chairs. I think uh, Alex will talk a little bit about that when she talks about some of what's going on in the restaurant industry. Um, encourage the tap and play. I'm having some challenges over here. Okay, so here's some questions, right? And this is going to be, if anyone has any questions along the way, please feel free to, to ask. So some of the guidelines, if you have sick employees that need to go home and stay there, when do they come back? So the, the guidelines should be based on what their healthcare provider uh, tells them. At least 72 hours have passed since resolution of a fever without use of fever reducing medications or improvement in the respiratory symptoms. At least seven days have passed since symptoms first appeared. And remember, the guidelines continue to change. So you periodically need to go in and make sure or need to work with your HR consultant or HR department on understanding if those changes have occurred. Okay, how do we communicate? And I think that's the key thing and understanding is the communication factor. And I know that I've heard a lot of um, organizations that are not having communication with their employees. No, you don't tell everybody. If someone's diagnosed, you wanna make sure that you don't notify, uh, sorry, you do notify employees, but you don't reveal who's sick, right? So this will, this will, does not help with, you know, um, making overall morale, overall morale within an organization work well because people are wondering who it is that's been infected. I, I know my dad is on, on this call and you know we had a conversation yesterday about this and how he didn't understand he wasn't communicated about someone who was infected and overall it puts everyone at jeopardy. So I wanna emphasize the, um, the importance of communicating and not providing names, but at least giving the update to your all your employees that someone has been infected. I'm pretty sure some of you have seen that from some of your buildings that you live in. They're providing information that someone has been infected, but there is no name. Um, okay, asking about symptoms. If employees out sick and sick and we don't know why you can why, can you ask the symptoms that are present? Yes, but you not, must keep it COVID related. Staying at home when exposed. We can make an employee, we can make an employee stay at home if a family member is showing symptoms. You should have constant communications if that is, is an issue for you. Um, employees are afraid to come in. Can we make them? So this is when you're dealing with fear of coming back, right? I'm sure some of you have experienced it. Um, you can make them return to work. If there's no legitimate threat and they don't require an accommodation, you certainly can make your own arrangements, whether it's the safety of returning to an office, um, all the measures that you need to take under the CDC guidelines. Okay, so talking about going into remote, remote work as the new norm. So really it's also some of these policies and making sure that we're, we're communicating what the expectations are, hours of work, expectations regarding reachability, 
frequent check-ins. How frequently are they scheduled? Timekeeping and hours work. Do you have a system in place? Is there a policy in place prohibiting off the work, uh, off the clock work? Are remote employees using their own equipment? So we'll talk about, I've gotten a lot of these questions from clients for business expense reimbursements. Are remote employees using their own equipment or services such as home internet connection, cell phones, printers to perform work? If so, please make sure that you're reviewing state and lo local laws that may require reimbursement of these expenses. As some of you have multiple locations, it's really important as HR professionals to make sure that you are checking your local and state guidelines um, laws to make sure that uh, if they are requesting reimbursement that under those laws you are are obligated um, again if they're working in different states or locality then where is the business located for this is in regards to state and local variations so you need to be able to understand and review again the local state and local requirements involved involving minimum wage rates overtime variations, minimum salary levels for overtime exempt executives, administrative, professional employees, even in regards to lactation and breastfeeding breaks and days of rest. So it needs to be clear on what the expectations are from the employers. Okay, I know that not everyone's having an easy time working from home and here are some tips. I think what we need to understand is that this is the new norm and not everyone is having such an easy time working from home and we're all going through the same challenges. So making space, maintain hours, get dressed every day, eat, drink, take breaks, communicate for fun, touch base with your direct reports once a day, if only to say hello and to acknowledge them. Try to keep some consistency and schedule. Returning to work. So some tips to keep in mind as you com communicate returning to the workplace situation. Make sure you're developing a clear and detailed safe work plan. I think I already talked about this. Write in plain, easy to understand languages. If you need to use images or diagrams where appropriate, feel free. Outline what building management is doing, how the company is supporting its efforts and clear expectations for employees. And if you need to partner with legal counsel, be sure to. They can help you steer clear of perceptions of discrimination and other potential employee relations or legal matters. I think that that's important as we'll see um, the cases, lawsuits that have been increasing over COVID, COVID challenges. So be sure to partner with legal or HR. Um, returning to work, get input from senior leaders if you're confused. Be sure you're training your managers. Even Nova will talk about this and change management and understanding some of the challenges as managers and, and supervisors and what, it, what is expected of them to make sure that they're communicating as the front line uh, for their employees. Okay, different media. I'm running out of time here. So we've got different media. Make good use of signs throughout the office to help with these key behaviors. Be clear is really important. Continue to communicate. Explain any situation that requires some type of communication for uncertainty. So here, here's an interesting um, statistics about remote work. 62% of US employees are working from home. 59 of them would prefer to continue working for home, from home. And 54% of them would quit their job if they could find an alternative to work remote. So in my world of staffing, I'm noticing a lot of questions about, is the job remote? So let's look at some of the larger organizations that are currently working remote and will some until 2021 or indefinitely. Google, Uber, Zillow, Twitter, Square, Uber, sorry, I said Uber, Microsoft, Reuters, Facebook, Amazon, Spotify, Salesforce. So really, I think some of the key takes from this is when we're working remote and we're managing remote, we need to really look at the empathy that we have, the collaborations that we have, and the communication. I think, um, okay. 
Um, and if anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I have many articles and resources. If you are confused or have any questions, um, I'm here to assist. Thank you. Thank you, April. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions right now, also, please feel free to put them in the chat. We will take care of that here um, afterwards. Alexandra Torres is up next from HR Butterfly Effect. Um, I have given you the control, so now you can change slides as well. Perfect, thank you. All right, so hi, my name is Alexandra. I'm also known as Alexa. I have uh, 15 plus years of experience in HR. Um, I started in Puerto Rico, my HR which is a very volatile um, HR atmosphere. And then I moved throughout the US and I've finally been in Miami about seven to eight years now. And in Miami, I got my master's at FIU and currently I am pursuing a second master's degree from Tulane University in labor and employment law, specifically for human resources professional to be able to help with legal matters within a company. Um, Today, I'm going to be talking about some challenges restaurants face post COVID-19. Um, as we all know, Miami is very large when it comes to the restaurant industry and we have been suffering a lot. Um, so I'll be talking on some very important points here. Um, my agenda for today is very brief. Um, I'm going to scratch on the surface, but definitely if you have additional questions, I'm here to answer them. So I want to talk about some of the challenges restaurant owners face. Um, we do have a lot of small um, uh, restaurant business owners and they don't necessarily have HR. They don't understand a lot of the changes that we're going through. We have a lot of um, mandates from local government. So those challenges are pretty rough on them at times. I'm going to discuss a little bit in, re in regards to compliance concerns and issues to consider um, when working with restaurants and some tips and possible solutions um, that can be incorporated um, within the restaurant industry. Okay. Oops, I think I went a little bit. Okay. Um, so when it comes to operational, uh, of the operation, there are a lot of challenges um, for restaurant owners right now. Just last night, um, prior to, um, having this presentation today, um, the mayor announced that starting August 31st, the restaurants will be able to open at a 50% capacity indoor dining. But prior to that, um, it has been very, very um, hard for restaurant owners. Um, some have had to be creative when it comes to ideas for having seating arrangements. So it's been very, very difficult. Their operations is not making as much revenue as they would expect. So they've been hit pretty hard, especially those restaurants that were closed for a couple of months. Um, back at the house restrictions, um, you know, we still need to maintain, like April was talking about, social distancing. You know, if you have a small restaurant, they have a small kitchen, how many employees can you have in order to meet the operation, but also, you know, comply with regulations? Employee scheduling has been an issue. Um, restaurant operations can be pretty slow at times. Not everybody's eating out because they're trying to save money. They're, you know, so finding people that can actually work and that can fit within the schedule has been some of the challenges. I've been working with a restaurant that they have operations limited right now. They're closed two days out of the week um, because it's not futile for them to operate the seven days of the week. Uh, within the five days that they are operating, they have challenges when it comes to schedules. Some days, you know, for their lunch service, it's very slow. It's mainly pickup and um, delivery. And for the evening, it could be a little bit more of a bulk. And on the weekends, they have um, more clients come in. So it's, it's challenging because sometimes you just literally have employees just sitting around not doing anything. So that's, that's an issue when it comes to scheduling. Um, changes in menu. I've seen a lot of creative uh, things going out there. I've seen restaurants create COVID specific menu, um, you know, COVID-19, 19 and under food items, um, limit their, their selection because when it comes to operational expenses, you have food costs to consider, you have labor costs to consider, and you have the main operational costs to consider. You still have to pay electricity, you still have to pay, you know, your, your location. I mean, 
it continues just like um, we have to continue to pay our bills. So does the restaurant owners and it's very difficult for them where they're not making as much money as they were before prior to COVID. So some of the compliance concerns that, and issues that I have seen lately has been within these target areas that I present here. When it comes to recruiting, we have a low candidate pool. A lot of people were in unemployment benefits. When those additional $600 were coming in, people were making a lot of money, more than probably they would when it comes to working at a restaurant. And like I mentioned, if someone had reduced hours because the operation is reduced and they make more on unemployment when they calculate, they're gonna stay home. They're not gonna come to work. So my candidate pool has decreased tremendously. Um, now that the $600 is no longer there, um, Florida is one of the, it is the state with the lowest unemployment rate. Right now, um, the Governor DeSantis has not decided if they are going to um, have the additional $400. So right now, I do foresee um, more people going out there to find a job because now they will need to have a job in order to be able to survive because I doubt that on 275 a week they'll be able to um, you know feed their families and whatnot. Um, we also have limit on roles that the company you know that a restaurant's going to need right now. If I don't have full-blown service in the front I only need my kitchen staff. Um, if I do have service in the front how many people do I need? So I have limitations when it comes to that. You know, I used to have perhaps 15 employees to operate my restaurant. Now I only need maybe three or four. You know, who do I recall from those employees? Are those employees willing to come back? You know, so those are the recruitment challenges overall. Um, some additional things that I have seen when it comes to recruiting, those that are actually looking for jobs, they're looking for higher wage rates. Um, they're trying to make money to survive and it's understandable, you know, just like, you know, we need to make a allowable income in their household Well, people are looking for higher wages and can restaurant owners really, um, you know, provide that at this point. So that has become a challenge and a compliance concern. Um, meeting compliance when hiring, you know, we still have to do work on um, authorization documentation. I know that USCIS um, was a little bit flexible when it came to um, verifying documents, but we still have to do that. I've encountered a lot of people who are unfortunately um, are, don't have the right work authorization documentation. They're willing to take even a pay cut, but we still have to, you know, comply with the law when it comes to hiring um, authorized, you know, people. Uh, we also have to deal with the CDC guidelines, like in safety and sanitation measures, like April mentioned. You know, are we going to take employee temperatures? You know, when we come to the workplace. Um, do we have sanitation um, sections? Do we have face masks? You know, what other things do we have so we can maintain our employees safe and, all, and also our guests? When it comes to policies and procedures, I have seen lots of changes. Um, right now, obviously, uh, face covering is required. It's a mandate. So policies like face covering have been implemented so employees know that they have to have the face covering at all times. Um, what about sick leave? Typically, restaurant employees, they don't have any sick leave. So would a restaurant owner consider putting in a sick leave just in case they do have an employee that presents symptoms, you know, they're not working for maybe, you know, 14 days because they might need to quarantine due to possibility having um, COVID symptoms, you know, are you going to pay that employee those, those, those 14 days at least minimum wage? So those are some of the changes that I have seen within the restaurants when it comes to policies and procedures. Um, DOL, the, the DOL wage and hour considerations, you know, we still need to comply with the Department of Labor and pay employees correctly. So one of the things that we, you know, I have a scenario that is um, a very good one. And when it comes to, we have two employees that are working in front of the house as servers. One employee is working during the week where my service is low. So if there's the service is low, what happens? They're not going to make enough tips. And if the employer, they have a tip credit, you know, they need to make sure that if the tips do not make the, to the, the, the minimum wage, then they would have to pay them the regular rate and not take the tip credit. So how do you, how do you make sure that you don't, 
you know, discriminate among two employees, you know, I, in this case, uh, this is my scenario, I have a female working throughout the week. She's not making as much tips as a male working throughout the weekend who's making enough tips, you know, and I have him on tip credit. So you have to consider the wage and hour and, and also make sure that you have the documentation to back up as to why there's a difference. Safety in the workplace. Again, I cannot stress enough what April was mentioning. You know, there's new re requirements to operate. There's regulatory agencies, the CDC, OSHA. So we do need to make sure that we comply with those at work as well. So when it comes to some tips and possible solutions, I cannot stress enough, and I agree a thousand percent when April said it, we need to communicate with employees daily. We always should be communicating with employees, but why should we communicate with them more? Because they can bring their concerns. They have personal you know, concerns, their family, their household, kids are starting school. In the restaurant business, people cannot work remote, so they have to come to work. You know, They are exposing themselves when they're treating um, customers. So let's listen to our employees. They perhaps saw something that brought, you know, they can bring to our attention that we can fix. So definitely communicating daily, it's very important for the operation. You know, one thing that has been helpful for restaurant and I've seen increase the presence via social media and online, you know, you bring up new ideas on how to promote your business on social media, do small videos, have um, guests comment on some of the food items that you're selling and things like that. Um, consider daily specials on most great food items. You know, sometimes we want to have something on the regular menu, but due to COVID, we limited our menu. So why not have a daily special to attract customers to the restaurant? Um, increase pickup and delivery services. You know, make sure that you're advocating and you're, you're marketing to uh, a customers that enjoy your food and can have access to it as well. Um, offer gift cards to boost sales. You know, perhaps you, you don't want to go to the restaurant right now, but you can purchase a gift card and you're at least helping a restaurant owner have some revenue there. And most importantly, and like April said, work with human resources to maintain compliance. There are so many new changes, so many new things going on right now that it's just overwhelming and stressful for a business owner. So it's definitely helpful to work with human resources, someone that can guide you, can create policies, can understand. And if it comes to something that it's within the legal parameter, then you should talk to your employment um, attorney. Thank you so much, Alexandra. That was great. I'm sure people have questions. Um, I'm going to now give control to our next speaker, Nova. Uh, Ivanova, take it away. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Let me just figure out how to do this. <laughs> uh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Ivanova Nunez. I'm originally from Venezuela. I'm a psychologist, which is why I always try to keep working with individuals and groups. And I've been working in organizational development and change management for the past eight years or so. So um, Alex and, and April talked about some very uh, important elements. And now we want to go deeper and talk about the people side of the change, right? Which is the reason why we're having this webinar and why we're doing everything that Alex and April will uh, recommend. It. So, I'll give you a brief overview about change management, about human beings, how human beings react to change, and what each of us as leaders uh, can do to lead uh, this change with compassion. So during the, the past few months, we have been forced to adapt to a constantly changing environment. But this past month has also been have also been a great a reminder that we all have an individual response to change but there are also some commonalities in the way human beings react to change that if we learn to understand them and identify them it will help us better understand everything that's happening to us during this uh, change but also everything that's happening to the people around us so when we talk about change, 
we're talking about disruption. Change creates a attention that is expressed in the form of conflict or excitement or fear or any other a, a emotion that can emerge as, as we navigate uh, the change. So when we're facing change, our mind is trying to answer this big question, what will the future look like? Uh, the thing is that in times like this, there's not a clear or a simple answer to that question. We don't have all the, the elements to actually answer that question. So that's when uncertainty arrives and we can feel hopeless, we can feel paralyzed, we can feel depressed, but we also have like this huge need for information, which is when rumors and probably a conspiracy theories start to arrive, which is what we saw a lot at the beginning of this whole thing, but since we have been also moving back and forth with the whole COVID um, uh, topic, uh, we've been uh, I'm transitioning to, to that uh, again. So let's try to understand a little bit what happens to us, to any human being when we uh, are facing change. So the first thing that happens to us is that we get into this state of shock, right? We're like, COVID, what, what COVID, what does, what does this coronavirus even mean, right? We don't really understand and we don't, we're not able to decode the information that we're getting from all these different sources. Then we move to a state of denial, maybe. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember at the beginning, maybe some of us were like, but is it really that, uh, 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 that big of a deal, the coronavirus, what's the difference between the coronavirus and the flu? Are these numbers actually real? Uh, is this gonna come all the way to the US or this, is this gonna, a, a, a thing that's only affecting Asia or then Europe? Uh, and then we move to a state of anger, not only anger at the situation maybe, but also at others and at ourselves. That's when we started blaming those that invented the, the bat soup or those that were traveling abroad and came back with the virus, right? Um, and then we move to a state of depression. That's when reality starts to hit and we realize that we're losing something because when we freeze in change, yes, we lose something. Even if it's just the status of school and the, and the way we are uh, used to do things. And then as we, uh, realize that this is happening and there's nothing that we can do, uh, we start moving to a, a phase of experimentation, right? Well, there's no other choice. I might have to get used to this. I might have to buy a desk so I can work from home and start uh, washing my hands every five minutes and washing all the grocers uh, when I buy my products or whatever. And then you start to gradually accepting the new reality and you start thinking well this might be good for me right which is what some of us started saying like oh i actually like working from home i spend more time with my family i don't have to spend that much time commuted to the office and then we finally integrate the change and we don't even remember how it used to be before so this morning when i was putting some makeup i was like how was it that i did this before because <laughs> i don't remember <laughs> i haven't done it in so in so long so uh, I wanna invite you to use the chat and, and reflect for it a little bit. In which of these stages do you think that you spend more time when you're facing change? Even though this is the pattern, when we face change, we go through a curve, uh, but we know not all of us express these emotions in the same way and not all of us have the same uh, coping mechanism. So I know that for me, maybe I spend a little bit more time probably in depression uh, and then I start moving to the other phases, but it's different for every one of us. So I wanna invite you to take up a, a few minutes and, and see the, this curve and try to identify where do you think that you spend more time, uh, in which of these stages do you spend more time when you're facing a change? Why am I asking you this? Because understanding how you uh, react when you're facing change it will help you have more empathy when you're seeing others going through the change. And it's also important to keep in mind 
that we all have a different way of coping with the with the changes. So maybe you're feeling uh, that, you, that you're accepting the situation, but maybe you can see other people in your team actually still um, struggling with some anger or with some depression. The other thing is that change is not linear, right? And um, the way we feel about change is not linear either. We go through these ups and downs, moving back and forth, depending on the situation. And during the past month, change has been a constant. So first it was the coronavirus, but then it was also working from home. And then it was also, a, I don't know, a, the travel restrictions or, or a, the difficulty to, or, or the, a, a, the, the lack of, 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 of um, time to spend with our family and, and the people that we love. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for your, for your input. Let's see what we have here. Acceptance, experiment, stressful, of course. One thing that I forgot to, to mention is that uncertainty is a big aspect when we're talking about change, right? And that uncertainty of not knowing what's going to happen, of not being able to answer that question about the future, of course, it creates this stress, this tension, because we're trying to, we're transitioning from the, the current state and the things that we know to a future state that we don't really know. And that creates uncertainty and creates uh, a stress. So uh, I know this might sound a little bit abstract, uh, so I want to give you a few uh, recommendations on how to actually identify where your team and yourself or maybe your family can be uh, in regards to the change and what you can do to help them transition, to help them ease the curve and help them transition through the curve in the shorter amount of time and with less intense emotions, right? Ivanova, I just wanted to tell you that you have two minutes. Okay, I'll try to rush. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Uh, okay. Do I have the con? Yeah, okay, sorry. So let me just move really fast. Okay, so if we, if we break down that curve into three stages, just to make it easier for you, let's try to focus on the first uh, stage. The first stage, let's call it ending, losing, and letting go. How can you see that people um, that, that your team is going through this stage. You're going to see a lot of questions being asked, which is what happened to all of us at the beginning, right? We wanted to have all this information and we were asking a lot of questions. You can see a lot of complaining and blaming, as I mentioned before, challenging. We're all very pessimistic. We have a very difficult time try, um, trying to see the positive act, um, outcome. And you can see people tired, probably from the lack of sleep that they're getting because we're all thinking about a million things, right? So what can you do during this stage? First thing, educate yourself, which is what you're doing today. Being here and understanding all the elements that you have to keep in mind as a leader, that's very important. Actively listen to the uh, concerns of your staff and their perception of the change. Don't just assume that you know what they're going through because you're also going through the same situation. We all have a different reality and we all have a different way of perceiving reality. And show genuine care and concern. Be there for your team. Accept their different reactions and provide consistent messages. Remember, again, we have a lot of, of uncertainty. So make sure that you fill that gap of information with official information and not let them fill that gap with YouTube videos and the information we had through our WhatsApp groups. Then moving uh, forward, we get into the neutral zone. So how can you know that you have people going through the stage? You will see people adjusting, bargaining, and actually willing to get involved. So use that and involve your team in the creation of this new reality. As April mentioned, create some uh, policies, rules, norms that can give them structure during this um, time. Celebrate the small things, celebrate the small successes. If you were able to, I don't know, learn to use a new collaborative app, make sure you celebrate that or that you, I don't know, are having daily meetings with your team and everyone is bringing ideas, celebrate the small things. That's very, very important. Also, as always, leaders need to walk the talk. So make sure you are modeling the behaviors that you want to see in your team through this transition and make sure to train them on the new skills. We're all having to adjust to 
new way of doing things. So make sure you give them the tools to um, successfully adapt. And then the new beginning, right? So what can we see there? You're gonna see people rebuilding, cooperating, actually focusing on solving the problems. So celebrate that, celebrate a, a change adoption, celebrate the efforts that everyone is uh, putting into to get to this uh, moment. Continue to communicate the vision, the vision of the future. How will the future look like now? Uh, document your lessons learned so you can always go back to what you learn and what will work. Keep your team involved and of course adjust your policies and procedures. And just to finish um, one more minute, uh, I couldn't finish this webinar without actually taking a few minutes to reflect on what we need to do as leaders, even though, even if we don't have a team, a, even if we don't a, ha, hold a leadership position in our organization, we all have a role in creating that new normal. We've been talking about the new normal, but is that a new normal that we're just gonna wait and see and, and hope that it comes? Or are we gonna actually have a proactive role in creating that new normal? So one key element when we're facing disruption is leading with compassion and understanding compassion in three levels. The cognitive level, which is conceptually, intellectually uh, understand the problem, the problem that we're in it and the problem that other people is facing, then affection or empathy, understanding on an emotional level how the other person feels, and then motivation and supporting and doing something about it and having an open mind, an open heart, and an open will. That's my invitation for leading this new normal. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Ivanova. I appreciate that. April and Alexandra, thank you again so much for all the wonderful information, great information. And I'd love to, at this point, just ask the audience, uh, what kinds of challenges have you guys had? Any questions that you have that, um, um, perhaps April or Ivanova or Alexandra can address in your in your that you guys are facing in this organization. Let me take a look at the chat. I haven't looked at it at all. Um, let's see. Would we have Alex? Do we have any questions? <laughs> no, so far we've had a couple of comments uh, on the question that Ivanova made, but no okay. questions. I'm guessing that it was very clear. <laughs> it was very clear, it seems. <laughs> so at this time, um, I would like to extend the invitation uh, for our guests to go around the room, um, say who they are. We are so excited that we have a great um, group of people here today. We're here to also network. So please, 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 please put your information, your name, your business name, your contact information, your email or phone number, however you, or even your um, your social media tags or your LinkedIn link, put it in the chat. We're here to network with one another and get to know each other. So um, let's start off with actually um, a fellow board member, Lily, sir. Sorry to put you on the spot, Lily, but start, start, it, start us off. Thanks, Shirley. What a great presentation. Thank you to our speakers today. Uh, it can't be any more relevant, uh, the topic, and helpful. Uh, my name is Lillian Sur. I'm the owner of Sur & Associates. We are a full-service law firm in Coral Gables. Uh, we uh, target, uh, our target market is small to mid-sized businesses. Uh, we also uh, serve a lot of restaurants, so the information that uh, was presented today uh, is very much appreciated. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And another fellow board member, Armando, who is our new treasurer. Armando, please introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. Armando Fernandez, I agree uh, with Lillian. Great topic, great pr presentation, a lot of good information that uh, I, I can certainly uh, try to adjust with uh, during this new normal. Um, I'm an independent financial advisor. I work uh, closely with business owners, small companies, helping them uh, get uh, greater outcomes from their retirement plans. Uh, so Armando Fernandez, my firm is Portfolio Square. And any CPAs in attendance today, feel free to, uh, to send me your information. I'd love to network with you. Wonderful. Thank you. I see Marcelo Lovell is also on the call. Um, Marcelo is an advisory board member. He is um, part of DoorCam Dor in Doral. Um, Marcelo, 
Are you able to unmute yourself and say a few words? Marcelo cannot. Okay, we'll move, we'll move on. Um, I don't see, I don't think I see any other board members. So let's start with um, Carola. Please feel free to say your, your name, business, and uh, what you do. Hi, um, thank you so much for the presentations. They were all very interesting and helpful. Uh, my name is Carola Senini, and I'm the school director for Talk Miami and Talk Miami Beach. Uh, in fact, actually, I'm not working because the, um, the classes are uh, being given online, but hopefully we'll go back to work um, in October, if possible. And yes, that's cool. all for me. Thank, thank you, thank you. So thank much. you. Um, and I made a huge mistake. I skipped over Alex Vivas, who is our um, marketing chair at Doral Bar. I can not believe I skipped over her. Alex, no, because take it away. I introduced myself at the very beginning, and, and you know I'm going to be very fast because I want everyone else to introduce themselves. Alex Vivas with Marketing Strategies. We are a marketing atelier, and we are ready to prepare your strategy for success. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, let's continue with Mario. Sorry, I'll okay. pause. I'm muting myself. <laughs> well, th definitely great, great presentation. Learned a lot. Uh, I work with Paylocity, so we saw HR technology uh, from HIRS and also payroll solutions. Now it's very important since we're going back to work uh, to offer a touchless uh, environment. So definitely with technology, we're able to help our clients uh, just provide that. Uh, definitely thank you for the invitation and look forward to joining the next meeting soon. Wonderful. Thank you. Ana Espinosa. You call me just as I was sneaking away because I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> you made it in time. Tell us. I did. Um, just really quick. I'm the owner of Luna um, Accounting and Bookkeeping. Um, I actually just went on my own this past um, January. So I officially uh, became an entrepreneur during a time of many Wonderful. uncertainties and difficulties. But um, so far, so good. I really can't complain. Um, my original plan to start Luna was to be remote. So I was one of the lucky ones that I already had a plan. I already had everything was already on a cloud. Everything was already remote. Everything was already, um, uh, like I like to call it out in space somewhere uh, while I was working. So um, so I, I personally got very lucky that my firm was, was able to, we were able to continue. Um, smoothly without any hiccups. Um, just maybe one or two clients that were still very much desktop and very much um, used to seeing me on a weekly basis. Those are the only ones that, that had a really, really hard time trying to, to go remotely and then trying to see me through Zoom or through a computer. Um, but other than that, um, I think that was it, right? Adriana, do not yeah. book. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. I left my information, my um, myself in the chat okay if you have any questions wonderful um nice to meet you but i have to go <laughs> thank you it was nice um for you to be here thank you deirdre nero welcome how are you buddy how are you my name is deirdre nero i'm an immigration attorney i have my own law practice in coral gables nero immigration law and we focus mostly on what we call business immigration which is helping investors entrepreneurs professionals companies uh, with their immigration strategy, uh, temporary and permanent. Um, I also help a lot of companies with employer immigration compliance. Um, in that regard, uh, I'm always interested in interesting HR related topics um, and here to support my friend, April Donia. And hi to everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you, thank you. Rene Negron, hi. Hi, how are you? Hope everyone is well and safe and, and healthy. Um, my name is Rene Negron. I'm a partner of Private Client Group, which is an elite producer group at uh, Equitable Advisors. And mostly what we do is help our clients have, a, I don't know if I heard the term, but it's called tax diversification strategy for your retirement. Um, I don't know if you all realize that after all this situation that we're going through and uh, the immense amount of debt we've taken, there is no other way that we will be able to handle it in the long term by dealing with that higher taxes. 
So the most important thing nowadays is to have a tax efficient strategy in mind that will help you retire uh, in a way that you know is dignity, is have a dignity. Rene Negron. Thank you, Rene. Thank you, Luz. Luz from Banesco. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Luz Padron. I work uh, for Banesco in the marketing department. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this uh, webinar. Mm -hmm. No problem. Thank you. Um, Pete De La Torre, are you on? Uh, I'm, yes. I'm here. Good morning, everybody. Congratulations to the three presenters today. Uh, great information, timely, of course. And I think that we've got to stay on top of this for a long time to come. Um, I am the founder and the president of the Business Forum Group here in Doroud. It is a private, uh, exclusive business group club where we focus on helping our members directly in their business growth. And we also partner up with the city of Doroud and its economic development. Um, and I think that we are all in agreement that uh, between now and the end of the year, we just got to leverage uh, what we have in front of us, take advantage of opportunities, and, and really prepare the foundation for 2021. But the, the work is now. Instead of waiting to January, I think we need to do that work right now and get ourselves ready uh, for what I think we can all agree could be a, a fantastic year. But the work starts now. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the, uh, the very opportunity. Very true, here. Pete. Very true. Thank you. I failed to also um, introduce Pete at the very beginning because Pete is also an advisory board member at the Doral Bar Association. So thank you so much, Pete, um, for everything that you do for us. Um, Zach, are you on? Yes. Hi. Um, Zach Evangelista. I work with Lily at CERN Associates. As she mentioned, we work primarily with uh, small and mid-sized businesses. We help with the, the gamut that uh, a business client needs, whether it's starting up the business, buying or selling business, business contracts, employment matters, um, help them with their um, succession planning and estate planning, litigation if need be, trademarks, real estate, leasing, zoning, uh, really anything a, a business could need. Thank you, Zach. Thank you so much. Um, Susana Martinez. Uh, Carol, Carolina Martinez. Yes, hello everybody. Okay. Hi. I'm not but I was listening to everything. I'm so glad for this initiative. As everybody was saying, this is just the beginning of a tough journey. But if we are well prepared, for sure, we're going to get there. So thank you for this opportunity. I'm an international insurance advisor, and I left my information there. So Thank you, you Carolina. Just contact me. Thank you. Great to have you. Um, so that uh, ends our round of introductions. Um, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> um, my name is Shirley Lopez. I am the secretary at the Durrell Bar Association and my company is the LLNL Process. We are nationwide process servers. We are also international process servers. And now we also do online notarizations. So um, that's fairly simple what we do. And thank you all again for having, uh, for, for being here, for um, listening for participating. Um, we love to have you back. Our next webinar is the last Wednesday of September, September 30th, where we will have Sir and Associates um, presenting. Um, there's gonna be two other panelists, but we don't have their name yet, their names yet. Um, um, it's going to be about how to start a business. So now that uh, we're going through this uncertain economic times, there's been a, what seems to be a, um, a or a spring of new business owners and people starting businesses and just doing what they've always wanted to do and taking this opportunity. So um, business owners need to know very specific things of how to start their business and start it the right way. So it's a very important topic. Um, we welcome you to come again next week. I mean, next month, sorry. I'm already getting ahead of myself. And please um, spread the word about the Doral Bar Association and our events. Um, we thank you and we hope you enjoyed this um, meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Ladies, thank Thanks. you very much. You are Bye, thank you so much for yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Great. Have a great one. Bye, everybody. Early, thank you so much. You always do such a great job moderating. No problem. <laughs> Thanks, Lily. Really. Good turnout as well. Nice group today. Yes. Very good. Very good.